presenting, there we go, presenting is Alyssa Miller, Chris Lemon, and Megan Jacot. All right, thank you all for being so patient and waiting while we figured this all out. So, as mentioned, I'm Chris Lemon, and many people are surprised to find out that I started off as a nanny. I was a professional nanny for many, many, many years before deciding to try and get into tech. Um, I actually was looking for a coding boot camp and fell into a Security Plus boot camp. And um, it all started from there. So I got, I did the Security Plus boot camp, and I got my Security Plus for certification. And then, like many people, uh, run into the issue of not having any experience. So not being able to get anyone to look at my resume or give me the time of day because I um, did not have the experience that everyone was looking for for, for an, any sort of entry level position. So looking through my options of how to kind of uh, get my foot in the door. Uh, I spoke with a mentor of mine and she suggested volunteering. So taking the boot camp and like, taking the initiative, right, of um, networking with the people within that boot camp, uh, the instructors, and asking if I could volunteer on the boot camp. They took me as a volunteer and then uh, ended up hiring me on the boot camp and through networking within the college and the different, you know, the program director of that boot camp, she asked me to create another course and then instruct the course, and it just kind of, you know, went on from there. So, was uh, still am an instructor at City Colleges of Chicago in addition to my current job. Um, but that all came from networking within that boot camp and actually uh, taking the time to network with my peers and my instructors and not just going there and sitting in on a class and then completing it and walking out the door. Um, so that's, that's my networking story number one of how I got my foot in, in the door in cybersecurity. Uh, and that started with cybersecurity education. And then uh, later on, actually, my very first conference ever was last year. I did uh, Black Hat. So if you could imagine, completely overwhelming for the first conference I've ever been to, uh, but an amazing networking opportunity there and uh, getting to speak to everyone who was in, within the program. And I ended up actually getting my first technical position as a security engineer through participating in the conference associate program with Black Hat. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> um, we're all here because the three of us met, we networked together, and we discussed the importance of networking. So we thought that this was a really kind of crucial thing to bring in. And so for me, my networking story, I'm, I'm Megan Jacko, um, also go by Carpe Diem Tech, and I was not originally in cyber, as many people are not originally. You know, you're not just born and doing all the hacking. And so I decided that when I was going to do a career pivot, I was an educator, I was teaching comp sci engineering, that I really wanted to get into working in the tech and not just teaching about the tech. And I thought to myself, well, I'm an educator right now. I'm, I know people who are teachers. I know some people who are in tech, but I'm not at all known in IT. I'm not at all known in cybersecurity. So how can I get known? How can I make sure that like people are like, hey, this is a person who's doing things, who's volunteering, who um, maybe is someone I can trust? Because if you don't know someone, you're less likely to trust them. And so I figured that in order to get known, I should start joining some of the organizations that are doing things in cyber. And so I joined and um, also participated in a number of organizations I still do today. And so one of the ones I joined was Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. And so I was in that group, I was on the Slack channels, I was seeing the different things that were happening, and people would post jobs. And so I would say, hi, you just posted this job. Uh, my name is Megan, 
And you don't know me yet, but these are some things that I've done, this is who I am. So kind of a very succinct, short introduction. Um, I had given a talk a couple years ago at Day of Security about doing a career pivot. So um, I was fortunate enough to have it captured visually, and so I would share that visual, and you know, you kind of like a picture's worth a thousand words. And so that actually helped me land me my first full-time job in cyber, because I'd been doing volunteering, interning, different things, but not working full-time. And so that kind of led to the, yes, I have my first full-time job. Now I am in cybersecurity fully. Um, and, and so that was really exciting, but all of that was through working with organizations, connecting with people, cold connections, right? Like they don't know me, and saying, this is who I am, can I ask you some questions about this thing you just posted? Um, and, and so that is how I got into cyber. All right, well, good afternoon, first of all. I don't think any of us said that, so I'm just gonna come and say that. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? They're awake, I told you they were awake. I knew it, I knew it. I was a little worried. So, I'm Alyssa Miller. I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Epic Global. No, that is not Epic, the healthcare company. No, that is not Epic, the gaming company. That is a legal services firm based in New York. I clearly did not start in this role, okay? I've had a long career in technology and cybersecurity that spans about 25 years. I've been a hacker all of my life. Some of us are actually born with it. Um, quite honestly, I mean, since four years old, I've been working on computers. At the age of 12, I bought my first computer. Some of you have heard this story before. Bought my first computer, I hacked into this online service called Prodigy. Um, I grew up in hacker culture. I grew up on IRC channels, hanging out with a lot of the other hackers at the time. That was my, that was my family. Didn't really think this was going to be a career, but I landed in tech as a programmer first and then later got into cybersecurity. Shockingly, somehow 10 years later before I figured out, oh, I could be a pen tester. <laughs> wow, you know that hacking stuff I've been doing? But, you know, I spent a lot of years in the cybersecurity community and, you know, like Megan mentioned, not really, you know, I mean, I just kind of did my job. People didn't really know who I was. I obviously didn't really connect my professional I still don't connect my professional identity with, you know, who I was in those IRC channels because we didn't know each other. You know, none of us knew who anybody was. That's, you know, all these cool handles we have today. That's where that stuff started was BBSs and those boards. But, you know, it was about 2019, 2018, that really all of a sudden, I had spoken at talks before, but things started suddenly taking off in 2019. I don't know why yet. I really don't. It's not something I tried to do. It's not something I set out to do, but it happened, okay? And more and more, you know, follower count grew, all those things, and I started building networks. And where that came in handy was that employer that I was working for in 2019, who shall remain nameless, but some of you know how to look up me up on LinkedIn. You can figure it out if you want. Without getting into the details, I experienced a situation of discrimination on the job there, okay? And it was one of those situations where, you know, I handled it completely wrong. And I, again, see me some other time over a beer, I'll tell you all the things I did wrong, the way I wish I had handled that differently, and the lessons I can share. But I needed to move on. Now, I wasn't yet looking for a job when one of my followers from Twitter popped up and said, hey, I work for this really cool startup called Sneak. And you know what, I mean, in all this time, I've been trying to climb that corporate ladder. I wanted to get to that next level. And when I got deal, I dealt with getting the passed over for, on this promotion and this whole thing, it, I kind of was like, well, cool, sneak, yeah, okay, what do you want me to do? Oh, we want you just to speak at conferences and do research and travel the world and do all this cool stuff. I'm like, all right, forget it. I am not going for management levels anymore. You know what, that's fine. Senior manager, that's as far as I got, no problem. I'm gonna go travel the world. I started there January of 2020. How do you think that plan worked out? <laughs> I did two conferences that year. I traveled one time internationally and that was it. So I was there for a year and right towards the end of that year, I, so I still did a lot of virtual things, right? You know, I, I did 54 virtual conferences that year, which is still mind numbing to me when you do the math on that. But that was the job. I mean, that was what I was supposed to be doing. So. Somebody that I had met through that process, and I, I don't, you know, 
you meet a lot of people doing those different things, but somebody showed up at one event I was hosting, it was a CISO round table, and it turned out she was the CISO for S&P Global Ratings. And she says, hey, we've got this job, we're looking for a BSO, would you be interested? And I'm like, wait, now that's an executive role? Really? Cool. So, here we are again. Another super exciting opportunity just came up completely serendipitously, but it came up through my network, again. Wasn't looking to leave Sneak. I loved it at Sneak. They're still, I, I'm one of their biggest advocates yet today. But I got this cool opportunity, so I moved on. Then about a year and a half ago, somebody in this room, who will remain nameless, shared that their company was looking for a CISO. Now, this was, again, came up through LinkedIn. I also happened to know the CISO who was leaving. Got my name in, just figured, hey, what the heck? I'm not, you know, I, I knew when I got the BSO role, that was like the next thing, but I wasn't expecting it that soon. It was only 18 months that I'd been at S&P. So, you know, I checked it out, and it turned out it was the perfect fit. And I'm now three weeks on the job, so, but so far so good, I love it. I've got a great team, I've got a great opportunity to do some really cool things in a really cool company all just because of the power of that network. Hello, okay. So, uh, you may be thinking here, looking at Alyssa, who seems to have everything all put together. I know, personally, in my mind, when I look at social media and I see people who um, everything just seems to flow so naturally for them, again, like Alyssa. Um, and I'm like, why can't I be that amazing? Why can't I have that, that networking skill? And um, I just want to tell you all that, again, it, it is a skill, and it's something that you can improve on. Um, not everyone is, is born with the, the social aptitude to want to go out there and just network and speak with everyone. A lot of people have nervousness and uh, anxieties when speaking. If you would have told me a year ago that I would be up here giving a talk, I would have literally laughed in your face. Um, it's something that I would have never imagined myself doing. And I'm, I'm going to ask all of you, even you nervous and anxious people, anyone who's ever felt anxious or nervous about networking with people or speaking to people, to raise their hand. And I want you all to look around right now because you're not alone, right? A lot of people suffer from this. And it's something that the more you do, the easier it gets. Uh, the more you practice, the easier it gets. So um, we're telling you all these reasons why it's important, but also I wanted to share that it does get easier. So some techniques for uh, cold approaching in person. Obviously, you want to introduce yourself and if you're like me, who feels like a deer in headlights when someone says, so what do you do for a living? Or what's your story? Uh, have that planned out, right? You don't want to sound like a robot. Uh, you don't want to have it to the T and you want to uh, gear that towards whatever type of event it is that you're at or who you're speaking to. But having those talking points and practicing them really helps uh, feeling natural and feeling confident when you're introducing yourself to others. Um, also, one of the things that really helped me in uh, getting myself out there and networking with people was setting goals. So, I don't know if you all are like me, but I am super competitive, and I love just any sort of gamification. So, uh, setting up some sort of goal for yourself, whether it's monthly or for an event, the amount of people that you want to talk to, or even silly things like, you know, I'm going to make sure that I talk to one person while I'm standing in line, or uh, I want to make sure that I connect with two people on LinkedIn. Vary it towards whatever comfortability you have right now and try and grow and push that. And if you can get a partner to do, with, do that with, like, that's, that's great as well. Um, I have a friend who is a very prominent personality in the industry and he has told me that he had severe social anxiety starting out and one of the best things that he did was he got one of his friends and they went to bars and they made themselves very uncomfortable until, and they could not leave until they talked to five different men at the bar. 
So two men going in, they could not leave until they, they accomplished that goal. So that, that helps take the pressure off a little bit, uh, for me at least, when you have that in mind. Um, and again, obviously taking the initiative, if you don't get yourself off the couch, get yourself somewhere, nothing's gonna happen. So depending on what level you're at and what your comfort is, even just getting yourself in a seat somewhere, even if it's you know a networking event and you don't talk to anyone, you're just there, that still, you know, that still opens the door 100% more than if you're just sitting on the couch not talking to anyone. So trying to increase that as you become more comfortable, start working the room and talking to people and things like that. But um, also remember to be kind to yourself and as much as you need to recharge, really listening to yourself and if, if you're ready to go, if you need to go, make that exit. If you get there and you need to go, make that exit. So just really being kind to yourself and, and making sure that you take that time. All right, so some cold techniques for uh, approaching, cold approaching online. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're introducing yourself in one to two lines. People who get messages, and I've, I've got this before, where people who get lots and lots of messages and you're getting you know, these, these very long emails or you don't know who someone is, make sure that you are telling them you know, who you are, why you're connecting with them, and don't just, you know, if you're connecting on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever it is, don't just click connect um, and this person knows, has no idea who you are, let them know who you are and why they want to talk to you, right? Why you want to talk to them, but also why they want to speak to you. Um, Make sure that you are actually doing some of the research in terms of looking at who they are and trying to connect with them. Uh, it's, it's really helpful when someone says something to me when they, when they connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message so that I know that it is not just a blanket statement that they send to people, um, knowing that they actually have taken the time to uh, know either what I'm up to or know something about me makes me want to connect with them more, right? Um, and again, stating your why as to why you're connecting. If you're looking for, if you're looking to get into cybersecurity, don't reach out to someone and just say, hey, can you help me get into cybersecurity? That's, that's a, a very, very, you know, tough thing to, to help with, right? Don't, don't, um, don't ask for something that you can Google, right? You wanna make it a specific question that the person that you're messaging can, can help you with and be specific as to what that is. So another, another thing that you want to kind of think about is you might have the opportunity to actually provide people with warm introductions. The more you network, the more people you will know. And so you might find as you're getting to know someone that you're like, oh, you're working on this. I know someone else who's working on this. And you can do a warm intro or you can request a warm intro. So once you've connected with someone and they know who you are, you can ask for a warm intro. So this is something that I do fairly often. I know some people in the audience that I know also do this as well, and I'm sure everyone here has also done this on the stage. And this is an example of one that I did. I have permission to share it. Um, just connecting two people uh, in regards to they had some common interests around threat intelligence. And so it was a former colleague of mine um, and then someone who is looking into how can I learn more about threat intelligence. Um, so they don't need to be very long. Um, it, but they can be really helpful for um, it, getting that person in front of someone because, hey, um, it, oh, I know Megan, she's introduced me to this person. So if you are trying to make a request, um, if you're trying to make a request, you want to think about, you know, when you don't really know someone well, you're asking them something. So try to not have it be so transactional more that you build rapport, you build a relationship, and so you're getting to know that person, and then you find, oh, hey, we have this common interest, or you have something that you're doing, and so then maybe that way you can help me, but I can also help you with some other things, but it's not like, hey, what can you do for me? So try to think about it as the building of relationships, and then in time it comes to be, oh, hey, you know this other person, I can help you out. Always try to seek to help as well, so think about ways that you can give back to the community where we're all in industry, 
trying to enter industry potentially, and so how can you help? How can you share what resources you're learning? Um, how can you maybe connect someone, like I was talking about the warm intros? And then a big part of that seeking to help is actually joining the community, right? You're all here at this conference, and so how are you being active here, right? Um, what are you doing to kind of get to know a couple different people or even like potentially volunteer if that's of interest and time is willing? Um, but how can you make sure that you're an active member of the community? And then as you're doing all these different things, share out what you're doing, right? So let's say you made a request from someone and then as a result of that request, you were able to then connect with someone else and then speak at a conference. So share out your process, share this happened, this is what the outcome was, um, and then that also can be another way that maybe if someone helped you with something, you can thank them too. So um, that's something that you can write up is like a long form on LinkedIn, um, a, a Twitter th thread, um, so there are a variety of different ways to do this. Or if you want to kind of just send a thank you message to that specific person, maybe you don't want to post on social media, you could write them an email or however you've connected with them and say, thank you so much because of your help. When I asked you for this, I was able to do that. And so just kind of sharing out what you did, I think is really important. So, whoa. Sorry, we switch mics on you now? So now you've got the loud person on the one that's got the gain turned all the way up. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this idea of personal branding for a minute. Because this is something that becomes so crucial when we think about, hey, I want to start building a network. I want to start connecting with people. A lot of times people think of, so, uh, think of their personal brand as like, well, this is how I'm going to market myself or you know, this is, this is how I'm going to get more followers. And that's great. And it will work for that. And, and certainly I want to help you understand how to do that. Now, as I said, I didn't really set out to gain followers, so I don't really consider myself an expert on how to do this. But what I can tell you is that personal branding is so much bigger than that. And while it plays into that, it plays into just being able to find those connections that Megan was just talking about. To be able to overcome those situations like Chris was talking about where you're just feeling socially awkward. Because I'll tell you what, <laughs> the reason why I speak at conferences is because I'm amazingly socially awkward. And what I figured out the first time I spoke at a conference was, hey, if I speak at a conference, People saw me speak, now they'll come up and say hi to me and I don't have to say hi to them. I kid you not, that is literally how I ended up doing speaking. So when you think about your, your personal brand, really this is the thing that should be your guiding light. Like your, your personal brand should be that thing, what do I want the world to see me for? And no place is authenticity more important than when you're thinking about your personal brand. So a colleague of mine, uh, Phil Gerbyshek, he's actually from Wisconsin. This was really where we met at a conference in like Phoenix or something. And he's from this little town in Wisconsin. I'm from Wisconsin, that was really cool. But he wrote this book and he talks about personal branding. What he talks about is, what's your weird? What is the thing about you that makes you unique or makes you stand out or that people are gonna remember. For him, it's the fact that he's from Krivitz, Wisconsin and he wears orange rimmed glasses. That's the thing that stands out for him. For me, professionally, the thing that was weird, and this sounds so bizarre to say this at a cybersecurity conference, but it was the fact that I was a hacker. All those years I was trying to move up in like corporate structures and get those higher level management positions that are always, you know, especially for women, really hard to break through past that manager level. I always felt like I had to hide the fact that I was a hacker. Like it, it worked well when I was working in consulting and okay, yeah, you know, companies that hire people to pen test them, they like to have hackers pen testing them. Funny how that works too, right? But what I realized was in the corporate environment, when you walk into a board meeting and you say, yeah, here's this person from our cybersecurity team and they're a hacker, like they get pretty jazzed about that. That's cool. So as things started progressing in social media, that was the thing I was able to latch on to and really you know, go out there and own it. That, that's authentically who I am. Now, if you follow me on social media, you know there's a lot of other elements of authenticity of my own that I share. 
barbecue, flight training, you know, I mean, there's, there's an endless list. I think I probably share a little too much. But the focus here is how do you want to be remembered, okay? What are the things you want to be remembered for? And let that be the thing that you bring to the world. That's what you're trying to get out there. That's what your brand is going to be all about because now you can start to build a theme around that. And in building that theme, you, there's a million ways to do that, right? Now, I mean, it doesn't have to be. It could be that it doesn't have to be any one specific technique. Your theme could be visual. It could be you know, something you do in a YouTube channel or you could start a Medium page, whatever it is. However you feel you want to get yourself out into the world. But let that theme guide you and ultimately, you know, be the thing that, that this is always driving towards putting me into the world in this way. And then ultimately, it's just evolving with current events. You know, I mean, someone <laughs> literally, if you, you know, my, my social media is kind of a wreck because I'm always changing my name, which I'm told you're not supposed to do. Um, but for a while, it was Duchess of Hackington, and then, you know, recently someone made a comment in a thread about my flying career, and so they're like, well, are you the flying CISO now? So I went with that for a week. But, you know, just flowing with that and being able to always, you know, kind of evolve your brand to match what's going on in your world, but make sure it's your world. So, you know, some examples of this, I mean, there's some of those identities on the left, right? Those are some of the things that I've embraced. I'm a hacker. I'm a CISO now. I'm an author. I wrote a book. Holy crap, I wrote a book. But I'm also an advocate. And those are the things that are really, that, that's the way I want the world to see me. I want the world to see that, you know what? Yeah, I'm a hacker, and I'm also a cybersecurity executive. That's, in my book, that's pretty badass. But I also want the world to see me as somebody who advocates on behalf of others. I've had a lot of privilege in my life. I've enjoyed a lot of privilege a lot of people don't get to have. So I want to use that and raise other people. Megan mentioned that before. Chris mentioned that before. Bringing people up. And so when I talk about themes, there's a few of them. I'm, I'm about throwing out the hashtags because it's a way, it does a couple things for me, but ultimately it's that, that first one is what I've actually just I had to go through a, a management course at my last job, and we had to pick a personal brand. That became my personal brand, do better, be better. Because that's the thing that matters to me more than anything else. And the whole point of that is, if you want to be a better person, just start being a better person. Do good things, and you become a better person. I am not a perfect person by any means. I wouldn't even necessarily call myself a good person, but I want to be. But then there's the hacker flight school. Like, holy crap, I'm, I'm like so fortunate to be tackling a lifetime dream of mine to be a pilot. So yeah, that's out there. And it, it gives me a convenient way to unite that under a theme. And then there's the hacker barbecue for any of you that are following that. Um, now, see, this is where this plays multiple uh, services because yes, it does create that theme. The other nice thing about using hashtags like that is there's like a lot of vegetarians and stuff who don't want to see pictures of barbecue so they can mute that hashtag. So it's kind of nice that way too. But think about this in terms of your world. What are the things that you want to get out there? As you're looking at current events or you're talking about different things that are authentic to you, what's a way that you can just sum that up into a little theme? Something that people will remember that they'll latch onto. Because you know what? I've seen countless Tweets and threads with do better, be better on them. I've had countless people sharing hacker barbecue pictures. I haven't seen hacker flight school show up just yet, but someone will probably pick that up at some point. But it's so cool when you see like people, now you know who has the same interests as you. Now you know who wants to hear more about that aspect of who you are. And that's how you build that brand. You get that following. People want to know more. You, you start to connect with all these various people that like, hey, yeah, we have something in common. We've never met in person, but this is really cool. And then you come to places like this, and you meet all the people you've never met in person. So when it comes to using social media, now there are some nuts and bolts here to be aware of. This is the more 
technical aspects of this, to make this just a little more actionable for you. If you're really looking to build a following or kind of maximize your visibility, these are some tactics you want to be aware of. LinkedIn, as you're probably well aware, allows really long form posts, right? And the reality is that's to some extent what people are expecting. On LinkedIn, the, the, the stats show that people are more willing and actually expecting to read longer posts. So this is where you can, you can tell a full story. You can still use hashtags, but don't use a lot of them. Um, because, well, you can thank your marketing people for that. Honestly, the studies show that marketing people love to throw a sh whole bunch of hashtags at the end, and people see that, and those are the ones they browse past. Your activity here should be focused on maybe a post a day at most. All right, and the key, this is the key with Twitter, or with LinkedIn, excuse me. Their algorithm is driven by interactions. And it's that first golden half hour after you post something that LinkedIn looks at and says, how many people interacted with this? And those are the ones that they're going to escalate and raise in the algorithm. Now that interaction includes your interaction. So if you're going to post something to LinkedIn, you really want to get visibility. First of all, the best time to post it is around noontime Eastern, okay? When you post it and people start to comment, comment back to them. Like their comments and then say something back, even if it's just thank you or, oh, that's really cool. All of that, especially in the first half hour, is what's going to maximize you. Now, obviously, LinkedIn tends to be more business-focused. You know, I generally, I'll talk about professional stuff there. I don't get into hacker barbecue and flight school and all that stuff on LinkedIn. But that's what I've got Twitter for. Twitter, obviously, is short form, right? I mean, 280 characters. What can you fit into 280 characters? That's what you get to say. Now, you can write tw threads. Threads are good sometimes. Be aware, though, if you overuse threads, that can actually, you know, people kind of get, <laughs> I hate to say it, but they just kind of get sick of it, right? But every so often, it, you can use a thread for effect. Okay, if you're, you've been tweeting a lot of stuff and it's just little, you know, they're 280 characters or less, that's great. And then when you show up with that thread and you announce it, that like, you know what, here's this thing that's really important, let's make a thread out of it. And then give it that threading. That's really impactful and that gets you a lot of interactions. Now Twitter, their interactions are more about the likes and the direct comments. But they don't have that 30 minute window, they actually expand it a lot broader. So, but there again, you, w the whole goal is to engage in conversations with each person who comes in and comment because that's what's going to raise you in the algorithm. That's when it's going to get you seen. It's going to get you more followers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously there's a, <laughs> a lot more humor, a lot more sarcasm, kind of sometimes people being jerks on Twitter. Um, but all those things are kind of just that, that is the environment. So use it for what it is, but be aware of what it is. So after you've done, you've put in all the work, you've networked, what do you do with this? You've put in the time, you've talked to all the people, what's next? So, um, obviously, you want to stay connected with your network and reach out to them from time to time. Keep connected with them. You do things for them. You know, think, think about things. Hey, so-and-so might be interested in this. Reach out to them. Shoot them a message. Um, it, you want to have a give-take relationship and not have something one way where you're always asking for things, right? That's the, the first thing for sure. Um, but also sometimes as you continue to network, and you're meeting more people and you're adding more people to your network, you do, you do need to be able to say no because you get sometimes inundated with requests and you have to really stay focused on um, what your goals are and what you can actually um, agree to and uh, you're gonna have to make choices, right, in terms of, in terms of, um, all, everything that you're agreeing to do. So, Hacker Summer Camp, um, you all are here, you know there's a million conferences going on. 
make sure that you are taking care of yourself while you're going to all of these different conferences and you don't need to do everything. Nobody can do everything. I wish I could go to all of the conferences and speak with everyone and you just can't. There's just not enough time and it, it is exhausting. So also make sure that you know that you can gracefully say no or back out if you've already committed to something and you've found yourself completely overwhelmed or work has um, just exploded and you have too much on your plate, it's better to reach out and say, hey, I'm so sorry that I said I would do this, but it's more than I bargained for or I can't do it right now. Um, that's okay. So we are close to the end of our talk. Um, everyone should have received a handout and um, we'll post these slides later, but if you are watching not here, um, don't matter. So if you're watching not here, uh, we have on our last slide this link and we did a shortened link version of it. If you are here, you received a physical handout. Um, and we thought because our session closes and there's a break, afterwards. So our challenge to you is going to be you taking the initiative and putting some of these things into place, doing some networking. And so you've got some techniques on there, you've got some information about, you know, if it's a, if it's a cold approach, um, thinking about setting some goals, thinking about, hey, do I just want to talk to one person, two people? You're not going to get to talk to everyone, can't do all the things, um, it, but really trying to think about, you know, what you might say, how you might introduce yourself, and then a question you might ask, right? I mean, I know a really great question you can ask is, you know, how's your week going? What are you doing this week, right? And it kind of opens up, like you can find out if they're going to multiple conferences, if they're just at the awesome Diana, um, or what they're doing, and kind of get to know people a little bit. So that's our challenge to you. Um, and overall, we really thank you for, I'm gonna tag that over. Um, we really thank you for being here. Um, it, it was a joy for us to get to put this together, and we hope it was helpful for you. And we'd love to connect and help you, too, and help you practice networking, but also, you know, whatever you're trying to do. So we have some time for questions, if anyone has questions. And that is it. So my question is sort of mechanical, which is I make connections with people, but they're like loosely held. Do you guys have any tools to organize and keep tracks of people that you may have only talked with, say at this conference and still remember them in like two months? Um, just like, I don't know, I, I try to use like various note-taking tools, but they don't organize things and yeah. I can start answering that and then if anyone else wants to tag in. Uh, so one of the things that I do is, you know, if people are exchanging business cards, like I have a personal business card, and then I'll write on the back of the card where I met the person. Um, some business cards you can't write on. I met someone today who had a metal business card that's wicked cool, but I can't, can't write on that. Maybe I have a Sharpie, but um, it, so like a lot of the paper ones I, I write on. And then I organize those when I get home. Um, and I actually like, keep like a little chart like of like hey this is where I met this person this is a like fact about them and so then if like I reconnect with that person for another thing I can go back to that and see oh yeah this you know um, it, Susan was doing this thing and so it kind of helps me refresh that um, but it's also honestly really okay to say like if someone comes up to you and they're like, oh, we met, and be like, can you refresh my memory? Like, like what, what was your name again? So if you like forget who a person is or um, forget how you met them, I just I try to be really honest about that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I write on business cards, organize them, I have a chart. Um, but I also like, my head I feel like works in spreadsheets, so like I, I really love Excel. Um, so that, that's more my style, um, if you wanna go for it. So I'll say, I mean, I. A lot of my networking happens through social media, and so I leverage kind of some of the tools that are there. Unfortunately, Twitter has a really nasty habit of screwing up every tool I use. 
So I used to pin DMs because I usually try, I use DMs a lot because DMs are easily searchable. And so generally, even if I have like a conversation with someone in a thread, if there's something there that I'm committing to or I want to make sure, hey, I come back and talk to them and come once, see how they did, I'll send them a quick DM and just say, you know, you know, kind of summarize what we talked about or whatever. So it used to be really cool because you could pin DMs, but now they only let you pin eight or 10. So that, that doesn't work as well. Um, DMs on LinkedIn are horrible. Um, sorry, if anyone works at LinkedIn, we should talk afterwards because I really am sick of... The problem with LinkedIn DMs is they, can, they encourage you every time you send a connection to send somebody a message and that pushes all your legitimate messages down. Um, so the other thing I usually try to do is I usually go looking for, um, you know, th there are ways to maintain lists. Um, Twitter, that was a great one too until all of a sudden now Twitter, even if it's not a public list, they notify the person you added to the list, you added them to the list. So that may or may not work for you. Um, but I do try to categorize, you know, like who I've talked to um, just based on, you know, kind of how we connected or what it was, if they were a vendor. Um, if they were, you know, somebody who was looking for help getting their career started, if they were somebody who was looking for a job, um, you know, I'll use those tools just within it. Wherever it's something that I know for me is going to be searchable later, that's kind of my key. And I usually try to find something unique that I can throw in there that I'll be able to search for later. I know that, that, was, that was a lot of advice already, but I do want to add that I am obsessed with OneNote. It is my most favorite thing ever. I have it on my phone, I have it on my desktop, I like literally have it everywhere. And I make a notebook for every conference. So I have a conference notebook and then depending on how extreme it is, I'll make pages for, for different aspects of it. And I do make a connections page. And the great thing about OneNote is that you can search across all of your notebooks. So you can search for a person's name, you can search for a keyword. I do a lot of keyword taggings and that that's how I, that's literally where I put everything I need to remember ever in my life. Oh, do one, any more questions? Yeah. Hey, Chris. Hi. I'm Marta. Um, so I am currently in the same um, boat that you were in. Um, I had an eight-year career um, doing electrical engineering, um, hardware security, and um, I'm just wrapping up Springboard Cybersecurity Boot Camp, having great interviews, and none of them like turn out. So um, I'm wondering, like, what exactly did you do to get um, from boot camp and, and I'm volunteering too. Um, I'm the education manager for um, cyber, a cybersecurity nonprofit. So what, how exactly did you get from... Um, from nanny yeah, to from, security engineer? Yes, security so, engineer. So really what it was, was it was my networking because uh, my very first job in education was through people that I knew that I had already worked with. And then my next job, um, which was what, as a IT security auditor, was through somebody that I had met while taking the boot camp. So staying connected with them, and I heard them speak about their position, and they made it sound amazing. And so I, you know, kept an eye on the company and waited and, and kept looking back for a job posting. The second I saw it, I emailed them. I said, "Hey, would you feel for giving, or would you be okay with giving me a reference to this position, or can, who can I talk to? You know, connect me with someone." Um, and that's how I got that job. So I had, like, you have all of the education, you have the credentials, but then having that extra, um, that extra bit of having someone who can vouch for you is really golden. And that's what this all is about with networking because it just, it, it makes it that much easier to get your foot in the door to talk to someone when you know someone there. Uh, my second job as well, the one that I'm currently in, uh, was through networking at Black Hat and you know, getting to know someone, and then once you show your passion and you show that you have all these different characteristics, people want to hire you. So the one thing I'll add to that, um, this is a surprisingly little known fact. If you get someone to give you a reference into a job at their company, there are a lot of companies now who if that happens, it is mandatory that you will get an interview. So leverage that. Now, 
The caveat to that is don't get overzealous and reach out to someone you don't know and say, hey, will you recommend me for this job? Because keep in mind, you're asking them to put their own reputation on the line for someone they never met and don't know. So that's where it's, yeah, it's building that network. But if you can build those networks with people, that's why that becomes so effective. Because now if they can give you that reference into a job, they'll probably get paid for it. Most companies do that now too, right? I mean, you, know, you get someone hired in for a reference and you, you get X amount of dollars. But a lot of the companies now, yeah, they actually, people don't realize that necessarily, but that actually can guarantee you an interview. And so much of that job search process is just even getting to the first interview because it is so hard to just get past that first step with applicant tracking systems and all the craziness. So, so also very similar to Chris, um, I, you know, networked with people and um, on my end, I just did direct reaches out to when people posted a job. Um, and I think like the big thing, I think the big thing around that for me was trying to think about a concise way to share, this is who I am, um, and then building that connection with the person. Um, the job I'm in right now is a security engineer. Um, a friend of mine here actually shared that position with me. Um, and she was like, hey, Megan, we were discussing how you wanted to do something a little bit more technical. I saw this post, so she introed me to the CISO, um, and I met with him. And so a lot of it is, you know, the people you know, and then they see something because they know you're looking for something. And um, it, finding both people who might be mentors, but people who might be sponsors and friends, and um, having a larger network kind of help look out for you, too. Yeah. Any final questions? Do we have time for one more? Hey, thank you everyone.